Good morning, church. How are you today? Let's stand as we read God's Word. 1 John 2.2 2. And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Let us pray. Father God, we come to worship you, the rightful King, King Jesus and Heavenly Father. We pray today that as we take communion, that we would have clean hands, that we would have a pure heart. Heavenly Father, open our eyes, open our hearts to receive your word. Open our mouths to sing forth praises. Father God, as we start this service, it is about you and you alone. So, Father God, have your way with us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O oh, earth, His wonderful love proclaim hail him hail him highest archangels in glory strength and honor give to his holy name like a shepherd jesus will guard his children in his arms he carries them all day long praise him praise him tell of his excellent greatness praise him praise him ever in joyful song praise him praise him Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, for our sins He suffered and bled and died. Come on, church. We are rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him, Jesus the crucified. His praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows, love unfounded, wonderful, deep, and strong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, our blessed Redeemer, His wonderful love proclaim. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, Ever in joyful song, praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song.
They came to a place named Gethsemane. Helps if I get the right chapter. Then they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. Divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide what each man should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which what says, And he was numbered with transgressors. Those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, Ha, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also among the scribes were mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. When the sixth hour came, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they began saying, Behold, he is calling for Elijah. And some ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him a drink, saying, Let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. The veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who was standing right in front of him saw the way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. There were also some women looking on from a distance among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the less, and Joseph and Salome. And when he had was in Galilee, they used to follow him and minister to him. And there were many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. You know, this morning as we have looked and and looked at this whole account that takes place there from going to that upper room all the way to the tomb, 
I don't know about you, but I have times when I sit back and I, I read the whole account. And this is why I try and do this once a year, for us to see all of it that transpires. All that Jesus endured. We can look at a, a few verses and we can see a, a certain thing. But here we see a full picture. And at times as I read this, I, I don't know how you might be the same way. I have a tendency to, to step back and say, Judas, if you hadn't done that. Pharisees, if you would have just believed. This is your fault. Rome, if you had just pilot, if you had just. And I hear what Jesus endured. And I want to start blaming those that we read about in the account. But the Lord reminds me of two different things. Number one is this. This was God's plan. Jesus, as we read it, he was there in the garden. And he prayed, can this cup pass from me? Father, if there's, if there's any other way, but yet not my will, but your will be done. I want to encourage you this week, mark it down. We don't have time to go there this morning. Go back and read Isaiah 53. As you read what the prophet wrote many, many, many years before what transpired that we just read, you're going to say, that sounds very familiar. And in Isaiah 53, there's a, there's a phrase in there. In verse 10, it says this. It says, but the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. Talking about the Messiah, who is Jesus Christ. Why? If so that he would render himself as a guilt offering. The only guilt offering that would not just cover the sins, but take away the sins of mankind. And so as we come and read, remember this was God's will. This was God's plan. It was the only plan that would remove the sin of mankind for those who would repent and believe in Jesus. It was the only plan. It was the will of God. This was the only way for it to be accomplished. Is that the perfect Lamb of God, Jesus would bear the, bait, the weight of the sin of mankind. He would pay the price, appeasing the wrath of God, removing the guilt of sin from those who repent and believe. So that's the first thing to remember, is that this was God's will. We don't get to blame them and say, hey, this was the Pharisees' plan, or this was Rome's plan, or hey, this was Judas' plan. No, it was God's plan. But the second thing that we need to remember when we get to that blame game, we don't need to look any farther than ourselves. At any point in the story, we could understand and look and say, you know what, this is me. I stand guilty like anybody else in that account. It wasn't just the sin of Judas. It wasn't the sin of just Pilate or the high priest or the Pharisees or the council or the elders. It wasn't just the sin of, of Rome who carried out the execution. It was the sin of mankind. It was your sin and it was my sin that placed Jesus on the cross. We like to step back and, 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 and look at that. That's why I like to look at the narrative because we, we, we tend to look at it from the outside and, and detach ourselves from it. No, we're right there in the middle of it. <laughs> it's your sin, it's my sin that placed Jesus on that tree at Calvary. But it was the will of God so that you, 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 
and I that if we would repent and believe, that we could be forgiven of our sins, that we could be given eternal life, abundant life. Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and have it abundantly. That's here and now with the Spirit indwelling us now as believers, those who are believers, so that now we are no longer slaves to sin, but yet empowered through the Holy Spirit, we can resist the devil. But also abundant life after this life in the presence of God for all eternity. See, salvation isn't just something we wait for. We get to experience now. We'll have the fullness of it one day when we're with him. And so as we gather around this table and we take the elements of the bread, his body that's broken, as we take the elements of the the fruit of the vine, his blood of the new covenant that was spilt, we remember that was done for us. It was done for you. It was done for all mankind. What Jesus endured, I don't know about you, I, I almost couldn't make it through reading that. What, what he endured, the abuse, the beatings, the scourging, You ever had somebody spit in your face? They reviled him, yet he reviled not. So as we come to this table, we come, as Scripture says, as often as we come to this, we do this in remembrance of him. As often as we come, what we're doing is we're proclaiming his death, praise God, until he returns. So I want to remind us before we come to this table that we're told that we should examine ourselves when we come to this table. The Corinthian church was dealing with this very issue. They were having the 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 Lord's Supper together and as they were coming it had become a a drunken feast. It had become a a, a feast of haves and have-nots. Those who didn't have came hungry and thirsty and those who had came drunk and full. And there was no concern for their brothers and sisters in Christ. And so scripture, as is, is Paul writes to them, he, he reminds them, he says in verse uh, chapter 11, says, for as often as you eat and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man, a person must examine themselves. Examine themselves. And in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. He, he, in fact, he tells him, there's a reason there's many of you that are sick or gone to sleep. There are those that the Lord had taken out, had killed, because they came to this table in an unworthy manner. And I don't say that to, to scare you, but that, there is seriousness when we come to this table. Amen? And the issue was that they were not right with their brothers and sisters in Christ. And so this morning, if, if you are at odds with a brother or sister in Christ, I'm not just talking about a member of this church, anybody that's a part of the body of Christ, when the elements come, you need to just allow the element to pass. There's not judgment. There's not shame in that. Praise God for your obedience to the word of God. Amen? Amen. Let it pass. And then what you do as soon as we leave service today, you seek to be restored to that brother or sister in Christ. And so we're going to have just a moment. Miss Jan's going to play. The altar will be open if you want to come. You don't have to come, but if you want to, we're going to take a moment. Just pray that the Lord would show you if there's anything that would hinder you from taking this in a worthy manner, that the Spirit would make that clear to you. deacons to come forward at this time.
Scripture tells us as we read this morning while they were there in that upper room, it says, while they were eating, he took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to them. Guy, do you mind asking the blessing of the bread? Father God, we just come with grateful hearts. We come this morning remembering after we've heard uh, just the beating and the the bruising and what our Savior went through, uh, not for anything he'd done, but for what we've done. We remember the body that was bruised and broken for us this morning. And Father, we just give you the praise, we give you the thanks, and it is in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. And after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to him and said, take it, this is my body. They're still there in that upper room. It says he had taken a cup and given thanks. Lord, as we think about what you did for us, Lord, it's behind our comprehension. But Lord, we thank you that you're willing to die for us, that we may have eternal life. Lord, I pray that as we take this cup, that it will be remembered that what you did for us, and we will remember it all the days of our life watching over us, taking care of us, in Jesus' name, amen. And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it, and he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. And as we see in our text today, as they're there in that upper room, The Lord's Supper is instituted as they partake of that Passover meal. It says before they left that place that they sang a hymn. This morning and gather around this table, we've, we've seen that this is the will of God, that Jesus would be crushed, that Jesus would be nailed to the cross, that Jesus would die, so that through his death, through his broken body and his spilt blood, he might be able to cover, to remove the guilt of sin, to appease the wrath of God. 
for the forgiveness of many, for all who would believe. We see this is the will of God. We, we know why he had to do it. It was because of the sin of mankind, your sin and my sin. And so the other question that kind of comes up after this is, this is, how do we know that that's the right answer? How do we know that Jesus is, as he says in John chapter 14, verse 6, the way, the truth, and the life? No one comes to the Father except through me. How do we know that Jesus' death on the cross is the only acceptable payment for sin? What evidence do we have? Well, you know, the story keeps going after where we stopped reading. I'd have you look in Mark chapter 15 with me, or 16, I'm sorry. You remember they're, they're there and Jesus is taken and he's placed in a tomb and the ladies are there and look what happens. In verse 16, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might come and anoint him. They're, they're looking for Jesus who had died. They saw him die. Very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen and they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. But he said... Here you go. You, you want the proof that Jesus is the answer for the sin, kind, sin of mankind? Do not be amazed, for you are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the affirmation that he is the acceptable sacrifice for the sins of mankind. The fact not only was it God's plan that he would die to cover, to remove the guilt of sin from mankind, but yet to show that he was the one and only acceptable sacrifice. He was raised to life again, showing that God had power over death and sin and the grave. And so not only did he allow the payment to be placed on there, he gave the affirmation through the resurrection that says, this is who you should believe in for the forgiveness of your sins. It's Jesus Christ. The resurrection is that proof. That's the the why. We have lots of other whys. We go back to Isaiah 53. We see the prophets who prophesied many things that came to pass about the Messiah, and Jesus fulfilled those things. But the cherry on top, if you will, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's not that he just wasn't there. When you go and you read in the other Gospels, you go to the book of Acts at the beginning and you read, you see that not only that it just that wasn't there, he appeared amongst other people. He appeared amongst hundreds of people. He was seen eating and drinking amongst them. In fact, in Acts, when we started the book of Acts, they were there with him outside of Jerusalem, and they stood there and they watched as he ascended to the right hand of the Father. And so as we come today in this time of response, how do we respond to this table? Believer, we respond by remembering that every time we come and partake of this, we are proclaiming his death until he comes. That's what scripture says. We remember the price that was paid for us. It was not a cheap price. And when we remember what Jesus did for us as believers who have already repented and believed in Jesus, not so that we might be saved, we already are, if we've placed our faith genuinely in Jesus, been born again, our response to the table is this, is because of what Jesus did for us, what can I do in serving him now as his child who's been redeemed? Who do I need to go and tell? I praise God this week, these ping pong balls represent our who's your one. I praise God that there's people who take seriously proclaiming the death of Jesus to those that they come across. 
believe there's two white balls. That's two people now that are being prayed for for their salvation. There's two white balls right here in this jar right here. I see them. There's a member of this church that's identified two people that do not know Jesus as their Savior. They're not only praying for their salvation, they're seeking opportunity to proclaim Jesus to them. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. The orange balls, there's 32 there this morning. That represents a member of this church. Not only they're praying for the lost, but they're saying, you know what? I'm going to give a witness for Jesus. I'm going to share the gospel with somebody that I don't know if they know Jesus or I know that they don't. So praise God. 32 times this week, people shared the gospel that they reported to us. Amen? And praise God. Praise God in his grace and his mercy. Of those 32 times that went forward... There's two green balls. That represents there's two people that we know of this week that out of those 32 times that the gospel was presented, there were two people who repented and believed in Jesus. One of those, I got a report of somebody who'd been praying, and I know praying for family for a long time in another state, got to share the gospel with a sister-in-law who professed faith. That other is another one of our members who was obedient, going out with a group of people on a Saturday to share the gospel and saw somebody called to faith. You know what? We got a report this week. Here, here. Get this. Got a report this week from a family sharing the gospel with their young children who don't know the Lord yet. And this first grade child, because he sees parents who pray for the lost, sees parents who actively share the gospel with the lost, came home from school as a first grader and asked his parents, I don't know if my teacher is a Christian. Can I tell her about Jesus? Not even a born again believer yet. Parents, grandparents, your kids, your grandkids, see your burden for the lost. And we should be burdened because there are people that are heading straight to hell, eternal condemnation, eternally separated from God. But yet we hold the truth that would set them free. It's Jesus. So believer, are you proclaiming Jesus' death until he returns? Others that might be here, you might be here today and say, Ricky, I've never come to that point. I know what, maybe you say, I I know what Jesus did. I, I know about Jesus. You might be the one like that centurion that was at the cross. He knew about Jesus. He had been around. He had seen everything that was going on. I don't know. Scripture doesn't say. He might have been one who spit, who beat, who hurled the insults. But at the end of it, after he saw who Jesus truly was, he, he realized truly this is. Truly, he is who he said he was. Maybe today is that day. Maybe you've been trusting in something else. Maybe you've been trusting in the fact that you were confirmed as a child. Maybe you're trusting in the fact that you were baptized as a child. Maybe you're trusting in the fact that maybe you were baptized when you were older. Maybe you're trusting in the fact that you're a member of the church and say, I'm good with God because I've done those things. None of those things save you. It is by faith in Jesus Christ alone. Have you repented of your sins and confessed Jesus as Lord? That's it. Everything else comes after that. The good works, it's because you've been born again. Baptism, it's because you've been saved. If you've not placed your faith in Jesus, we're going to give you that opportunity this morning. I'll be here. Our staff will be here. We would love to talk to you about how you can know that you have forgiveness of your sins and eternal life through Jesus Christ alone. The way, the truth, the life. There's no other way to the Father except through 
Jesus. No works of yourself, no works of man, no works of being a part of a church. It's through Jesus Christ alone. So, Father, today, in this time of response, have your way amongst us. If there's those here today who do not know you as their Savior, Father, I pray as your Spirit convicts, I pray as your Spirit draws, Father, that their response is repentance and belief in Jesus. Father, for the ones who need to be obedient and come, you unite with this church as a member. Father, I pray that they step out and they come forward and be obedient in that manner. But Father, however we need to be obedient today. Father, maybe there's some amongst us who are just hurting or you're just you're, you're heavy for, for a lost person and you want someone else to pray with you, Father. Father, we're here. Father, move amongst us in this time, Lord. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. You stand as we respond.